The following message is from King's Cross Church in Manchester, New Hampshire. For more information, please visit us at kingscrossmanchester.com. We are going through the book of Exodus. We started a few weeks ago. We did, uh, did kind of an overview of what the book of Exodus is all about. And then we, are, we got to meet Moses, and we got to meet Israel, and then we got to meet God. And now, before things start heating up, we're going to kind of look at this uh, chapter 4 through chapter, the beginning of chapter 7. I know it's a big section of scripture, and we're not going to read all the verses in between. But I'm going to, what we're going to do is I'm just going to pick out verses as we walk through this. But we're going to pick up in chapter 4. And first, we're going to pray and ask for God's help because we need it. And then we're going to start looking at Exodus chapter 4. So let's pray and ask for God's help. Father, we, uh, we turn to your word now because we love you and you have spoken to us and you've revealed yourself to us. And so God, would you help us to know you and to trust you? And Father, would you meet us as we look at your word now and surprise us by who you are? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, I, I don't know if you guys saw this or not, but we did, uh, we did a marriage seminar last night and this morning um, with Great Exchange and uh, River of Grace Church. And uh, one of the things that always comes up when you're talking about marriage or relationships in general is, um, you might call it uh, conflict or arguments, right? They, they tend to happen a good bit. Maybe you've heard of this. Um, but uh, they, we tend to have the most conflict in marriage or in our relationships or in our families uh, because of this hidden thing that kind of sits under the surface called expectations, right? We all have these expectations of how uh, people are supposed to live or how they're supposed to treat us or how we're supposed to be treated or how things are supposed to happen. Uh, expectations tend to govern the way we think of things in a sort of, uh, you know, the Wizard of Oz, don't look at the man behind the curtain. They're pulling the strings and everything, but we don't really see that they're there. Expectations kind of rule the day in a lot of ways. Um, when it, one of the more humorous ways is... Um, if you've ever played a board game with me or played card games, um, I'm already seeing Amanda laugh. You will know that I expect to win. <laughs> it's just, it's just an obvious motive. I expect to win the game, and I'm going to play to win. And the problem is, I expect that other people want to play the game the same way as well. So, one of the the ways Michelle and I have had some arguments that have happened in our marriage is, um, we'll sit down to play a game. And Michelle does not care to win at all. Like she doesn't operate under that expectation. Um, but then she just demolishes me. And so it causes some problems, right? Because I'm trying to win, and I expect to win, and she doesn't care, and she's trouncing me a 1,000 points to 10. Um, but it's... Uh, so expectations are kind of how we live, right? One of the ways... I, I love to... Uh, I expect for... Uh, and Michelle's in my marriage. I expect her to affirm me, because that's just the way I expect people operate. And she... Um, <laughs> doesn't operate under that expectation. Expectations, they, they rule how we engage people, they, 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 they rule our lives and how we think about things, and expectations are actually, I know this is a large piece of scripture, but expectations are what we're, we're engaging here. We're, we're, when we're picking up chapter 4, verse 18, so God has just revealed himself to Moses, God is about to send Moses back to Israel, and God is going to begin to deliver them. And as this story is beginning to pick up, expectations are right in the forefront. Their expectations are right in the forefront. And what we are going to be looking at is how God engages those expectations because God engages them in a way that they don't expect. God, God shows up and he's bringing his redemption. He's bringing his salvation. He's leading his people out of Egypt. And they, uh, they are beginning to confront their expectations about who God is and how he should work. Because uh, it's great that God's on the scene, but he's not exactly doing things the way they expected. So, what we're going to be looking at, we're just going to walk through this passage, four, four sections. We're going to look at God's unexpected defense. We're going to look at God's unexpected delivery. God's unexpected worship and then God's unexpected grace. So we're going to pick up chapter 4, verse 18. 
And here's what I'm going to, instead of reading all these verses, we're going to, we're going to focus in on sections, but I'm going to give you the, the kind of the sense of the story. Because there's a lot of story, a lot of narrative, what's going down. And I'm just going to give you a bit of a sense of the story, and then we'll focus in on a couple of verses. So pick up verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse eight, 18 through 26. That's the section we're looking at. And we're looking at God's unexpected defense. Because here, so Moses has just had this encounter with God, the burning bush, right? God speaking out of the burning bush. Who are you? Encountering God. And then God sends him on this mission. So Moses goes back to his father-in-law and he says, okay, here's the deal. God told me I need to go. And I need to go lead, lead his people out of Egypt. Being a good father, trying to care for his family, trying to provide for his children. Father-in-law says, okay, God told you, go on. And uh, so Moses leads his family. They're going back to Egypt. Along the way, um, there's a situation where uh, Zipporah, Zipporah, his wife, um, has to circumcise their son because Moses hasn't circumcised her son. And uh, God is at knocking at the door uh, ready to kill them <laughs> because they haven't circumcised their son. So it's this weird situation where God told them to go back and then uh, they need to circumcise their son. So it's a bit of a weird situation. And then right in the middle of it, Right in the middle of it is this section, verse 21 through 23. It goes like this. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before, Moses, before Pharaoh all the miracles that I put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord. Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So it starts out with Moses providing for his children, providing for his family. And then there's a situation where Zipporah, his wife, um, make sure that their children are a part of God's covenant community, so his, they're, they're marked as God's people. And then right in between these two family sections is this situation where God says, there's, we have this text where it says there's, there's two fathers and sons in view, right? There's God and there's Pharaoh. Pharaoh has his son. And then who does, what does God say is his son? God says the, the people of Israel are his son. That, that's a bit strange. That's not exactly what we would expect to say because you would expect God to say, let my people go. There's this whole nation of people. They belong to me, right? They, they should be mine. But God looks at them and he says, no, not, they're not just kind of a regular general people. They are my son. So here you have God making a, a, a clear, he's drawing these people in to be identified as not just kind of like his people, but they're his son, right? So just remember, in the cultural meaning of the time, that's not saying men are better than women. What that means is that these are the people that are going to inherit all the good things that God has to give. Right? These are all the good things that God has. In that culture, the firstborn son would get the inheritance, and everything that was left over would go to the sons after him, and then, you know, marry off the daughters. Just the way the culture went. I'm not saying it's the best idea, but... God takes that idea and he says, all the people of Israel, they get, they're my firstborn son. They get all of the things that I want to give them. They get everything that's good. So God is treating Israel as his people, right? So you have Moses and his family. And you have the situation with Moses' son. And then right in the middle, you have God taking on his people as his people. Which is to say, the expectation here is that if God's going to save people, like he's just going to kind of do it and we can kind of casually be a part of things. Like, okay, God's, God's a good guy. Like, God, what God does is he just writes the check on mercy, right? God's always the one who's being merciful, he's being helpful. But this is saying, no, you don't have a casual relationship with God. God draws, you, draws Israel in as his son, right? His distinct firstborn son. We don't just casually become a part of God's people. Right? If you imagine if you were uh, to become a citizen of America, there's a process, right? It's, it's an extensive process. I don't know if you ever heard the process for how to, you know, how to get your green, green card and then everything from that to taking your citizenship. 
vows, is that what they're called? Oath. Oath. It's a process, right? It, it, you don't just like casually become an American citizen. And this is what God is identifying here. You don't just kind of like casually become a part of his people. There is, you, you are distinct, you are marked out by his people. But here's the connection, right? So the connection is not just simply, okay, now you need to identify with God's people. Actually, the identification, actually, the process, it goes through Jesus. What's fascinating is you have the situation over at the beginning of Matthew. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but in the beginning of Matthew... Chapter 2, right after we just, so we just celebrated Christmas. So this is probably like right in the situation that we're talking about, right? So we just had Christmas, and here, chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Now when they had departed, so Moses, jo, Mary, and Mo, Mary and Joseph, they, they departed. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Man, does that not sound familiar, right? We just looked at how Moses was not destroyed because God's enemy was coming after him, killing all his children. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. And this is to fill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I will call my son. Jesus is clearly within the story of the Bible. So you have people of Israel, and they're called God's son, and yet they fail at it, right? They stink at being God's son. They just don't. But then God sends Jesus, and Jesus is said to be God's son in this way. He's the, he's the perfect, he's the true Israel. He is God's son that will perfectly fulfill God's plan, that will perfectly obey God, that will perfectly love God, that will perfectly obey God's mission, right? And he, you have Jesus being identified with this whole into Egypt, out of Egypt storyline, right? And that's what we're looking at in the book of Exodus, right? In Egypt, out of Egypt. Jesus is this perfect Israel where he perfectly fulfills. He is the perfect son of God. He's not just kind of God's son because... You know, he's a part of the Trinity, and that's the way it goes. No, no, he, he's a part of, this is God's distinct, redemptive plan, right? This is God's story in Jesus, perfect is true Israel. And as we look to Jesus, that is how we become a part of God's family, right? When God looks to, at Jesus, and we are in Jesus, we are now a part of God's true people. Right? That's, so we're talking about this casual relationship, right? God doesn't just kind of, casually let us be a part of his people. He, there's a distinct way. And God, God's defense of us is not just to say, oh, well, you know, you really got these problems and that's the way I am as God. No, he, he tells us, this is how I give you mercy. This is how I help you. This is how I redeem you. This is how I save you. Because I've sent my son to be the true son that is perfect in every way that I love and delight in. And I want to give everything to Jesus. And then when we look to God and we say, we're in Jesus. We, we need him. We, we need help. We don't, we don't have anything that can do anything for us. Like, we need your help, God. And God looks at us and he says, oh, you're in Jesus? You get the world. You get everything. You get everything that you need. You get you, everything that, you would, that would hold you in sin and judgment and condemnation. God gives you freedom and deliverance, and he defends you in Jesus, right? Israel, through this whole story, and in the rest of the Bible, has got lots of enemies. I don't know what enemies you've got. I can name off a few, right? We got our own sin in our hearts that makes us want to reject God, ignore God, rebel against God, not really care about God. We have our own kind of just habits that lead us away from God. We have our, our world around us, as much as we love the ways in which God has blessed us, right? I don't exactly turn on the TV and think, just take me to glory, Jesus. I just, it doesn't lead me into God's presence. We have things that want to pull us away from God, ourselves, our world around us. But God has said, I will defend you. I will protect you from yourself, <laughs> from the world and its effects on you. 
because you are my son and daughter in Jesus. You're my family, right? We, we talk about, uh, oh, I'll do anything for my family. I'll do anything for blood, right? God looks at you and says, you're my blood. You're my family. I will do everything to defend you. I will do everything to defend you from all that would destroy you and take you down and take your life. God will defend you because you are now his family in Jesus. So, as we would expect God to have a casual relationship with us and we would expect God to honor our desire to have a bit of a standoff relationship with him, God surprises us. The unexpected way he comes near to us is he says, no, you're my family. So, Let's pick up the story, right? Moses is going back to Egypt. And so here we come to verse 27. We're going to find, that God, we're going to find God's unexpected delivery. We would, we're going to pick up verse 27. And so Moses goes out, meets with Aaron, his brother. Haven't seen you in 40 years. How's it going? Good to catch up. All right, God's told us we're going to go back and lead his people out of Egypt. And so they go back to Egypt and they say in verse 29, Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. So just remember those signs, right? Signs were a a staff that turned into a snake, um, a hand that he could put in his cloak that would come out leprous, so right, uh, that's like a flesh-eating disease. Come out. It's a magic trick, goes in and out, not there. Um, and then turn water uh, into blood, right? Take water, throw it in the ground, becomes blood. So there's the signs, perform them, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Don't we wish that the story ended there? But the story does not. The story picks up. So, they have come back. God has heard you. He's seen what's going down. He knows that you are oppressed and afflicted and that you just cry out for his deliverance. He sees, he knows. All those prayers for all those years that you've prayed, God, where have they gone? They've just bounced off the ceiling. God's heard them. And he's seen and he's come and deliver. And so Moses and Aaron, they go into Pharaoh and they say, Pharaoh, here's the deal. God wants his people, uh, he wants his people to come out and worship him. And and Pharaoh's like, oh really? God wants his people to come out and worship him. (laughs) Okay, well here's the plan. Um, How about more work, the same production level, and I'm not going to help you out anymore because clearly you guys are a bunch of lazy jokers and uh, I'd really just like to get my work done. Um. And so things get harder, right? So the technical details are that uh, same production level of the bricks, right? They have to produce the same amount of bricks. Um, Their foreman previously had straw provided. No more straw. You have to go get that. Now bring it back and then provide the same level of brick production. We're not going to get into the details of how you make bricks. It's a lot of work. (laughs) You can go watch YouTube videos about that. But it is... um, so things get harder, right? Things intensify. And so when all this happens, people kind of flip, right? They're like, um, God, I thought you were here to deliver us. Why did things suddenly get harder, right? Let's pick up verse, chapter 5, verse 17. So this is Pharaoh. But he said, you are idle, you are idle. This is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must strive and deliver the same number of bricks. The foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. And have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So here these people were. Moses and Aaron show up on the scene. God has heard your affliction. 
Thank you, Jesus. Things get harder. What the heck? <laughs> right? They are, they are angry. They're ticked. This is not what they expected. Right? They expected for God to show up and it to be kind of like, woohoo, heaven, vacation, here we go. Nope. That's not what's going down. Things get harder. Now, one thing just to kind of keep in mind here that I'm not sure we would intuitively know from this, but so they say, uh, Pharaoh, would you let us go out for this three day, go out and worship for three days? And what's helpful to remember or to know is that um, that was actually pretty common at their time. Like uh, all the Egyptian workers at the time, they would take three days off to go worship their deity. So this is not like an uncommon request, right? And there's something in here where God must have said, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to say, let's go for a three-day um, worship time to go retreat, to go worship God. So this is not like an unusual request. And so I think what's going on here is that this is not an, an unusual request with an unusual response, right? So Pharaoh is like, oh, you want to go do this thing that everybody else in our nation does? You want to go worship? Um, no. And we're going to make it harder. And he presses them down under his thumb. I think the reason that, ha- that happens in this story is to show that Moses and Aaron and the people of Israel will not be delivered by the generosity of Pharaoh. Pharaoh will not be a contributing help to God's redemptive plan. To God's story to save his people, they are not going to have anything to help. They're not going to help in any way. And if you have been a Christian for more than five minutes, there is a part of the story that begins to feel very familiar. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Jesus, you died for my sins. I am redeemed. I am forgiven freely by your grace. I can stand before God. I have a clean conscience because you died for me. And my sins don't stand in front of God anymore. God, thank you for loving me in Jesus. And then you walk out the door and somebody cuts you off in traffic and you want to kill them, right? I mean, maybe that's the way I operate. But it, things get harder, right? I thought that I was going to quote, live in victory. <laughs> no, no, here's what happened. Jesus has freed you from the condemning power of sin and now you're going to learn um, you can't trust your heart and you can't trust the world. You can only trust Jesus. And that simple line is hard work. It's hard to learn. I cannot trust myself. I can't, tr- I can't contribute anything to my salvation. I can't, deliver, I can't deliver myself from myself, right? How many times have I said, oh, if I could just not be me, right? <laughs> That's what these people are learning. Their expectation is God's going to come and save, and it's just going to be a heavenly boat ride out of this place. But that is... God's story of deliverance, right? When God comes and delivers us from sin and Satan and death, it is not the storyline that we expect, right? It is not the story that we expect. I don't know what your expectations were for the Christian life. I don't know what you expected to find when you trusted in Christ. But I imagine we could all sit down after dinner tonight and say, in specific ways, I'm not where I thought I would be. Every one of us. I didn't think it would be this way. I didn't think it would be this hard. I didn't think that it would be this difficult. I didn't think that I'd be facing the same challenges. I mean, I don't know if any of you journal. One of the most depressing, I love to journal, I journal every day, but one of the most depressing things to journal, to do, is to look at my journals from 10 years ago and say like, I'm still the same dude that's got the same problems. I got the same issues from 10 years ago, right? I'm still struggling with the same things. I mean, maybe I have like a better way of looking at them, but it's still like, I still struggle with being angry at stupid stuff 10 years ago, and here I am today, same thing. But God's deliverance is in many ways to make our own power and our own strength and all the tools in our own tool belt. God's deliverance is to make us not trust in those things, to not go to the things that we would find comfort in for our deliverance, right? To whatever it is, 
I don't know what it is for you. What is it that you go to to find comfort when things get hard, right? That's your functional savior. The things that you go to, right? Maybe it's the websites. Maybe it's the movies. Maybe it's the food. Maybe it's the neighbor, right? Maybe it's the relationship. When things aren't going the way you want. When you think, I thought that by this time in my life that I would have a spouse or I would have this level of job or I would have this level of income or I would have this level of, you got me? Fill in the blank. That's your functional savior. And God is writing your story so that you get God and nothing else. But when you get God, you get everything. (laughs) You get everything that you need. Right, God's not going to share his deliverance with, in this story, he's not, going to, he's not co-share, co-deliverer with Pharaoh. In your story, God's not co-deliverer with your wife, your husband, your family, your income, your job. Those things will not deliver you. And so God's deliverance is not what we would expect. God does not deliver us But, I love this, just notice verse 31. And the people, verse 40, sorry, that was chapter 4. God comes to deliver them, right? Right, chapter 4, verse 31. And the people believed, and when they had heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, right? God did not just come to visit. God does not come just to visit with you, to deliver you, three-day weekend with God. God comes to dwell. God moves in because he would deliver you to himself to have God. I don't know what the expectations are that are not being met in your life. But when you're you're trusting in Christ and you're leaning on Christ, you get God himself and he dwells with you. But he doesn't just dwell I'm just going to pick up again in the story. God comes to, to deliver them. His unexpected, we're seeing his unexpected defense of them, right? They're his son. Not a casual relationship. God comes in with, with this unexpected delivery, right? It's not a story that they would have written. <laughs> not an unexpected uh, contribution. <laughs> It's okay. We're all pretty relaxed here. And now we're going to look at God's unexpected worship. We're going to pick up in chapter 5, verse 22. So, Moses comes out, right? He comes out of this meeting where where Pharaoh is like, listen, um, we're going to make this really hard for you. This is not going to be okay. Uh, You can't worship God. And so the people will say, uh, they basically give a, a curse to Moses and Aaron. They're like, God curse you for doing this to us. And so then Moses, um, being a strong-willed leader that he is, he takes that HR complaint and goes right to God. Says, "God, what's the deal? <laughs> this is a problem. I thought this was not the, I, this is not the way I expected this to go. Even though God had said I'm going to harden his heart, and this is the way it's going to happen. But what God does is fascinating, me, right? So God, God hears their complaints. He hears what's going on, and then. In this section, God, God effectively leads them. He responds to their trial and their pain and the problems, and he leads them into worship. That, that's not what I would expect, right? Um, maybe some judgment, maybe a little bit of some hellfire and damnation from the sky might be something that would be helpful. But God leads them right into worship. And what's hard to pick up sometimes in this passage, is, or in this, the way it's formatted, um, in our uh, in our Bibles, um, it's not impossible to pick up, but it's actually kind of helpful to break it out because actually God responds to them with a song. And so what I've actually done is I've I've got this. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yes. So this is I've formatted this so that we can see the song because actually what God does is He responds to them and. We're going to have a chorus and then some verses and the chorus is going to repeat and then some verses and then the chorus. So just 
We're just going to read through this because I want you to see this is how this is actually the way God, God sings them a song. So then God spoke to Moses and said to him, the chorus is, I am the Lord. Verse one. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, but my, but my name, the Lord, did I not make myself known to them? It's in verse two. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. In verse three. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, but I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the people of Israel and the chorus. I am the Lord. And then verse 4. And I will bring you out, of under the, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from, the, from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great acts of judgment. I will, take, I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And then verse 6. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. So remember, he started verse 1 saying, I'm going to fulfill this promise and he ends verse 6. To Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I will give it to you for a possession. And then the chorus, I am the Lord. So what do you think the point of this song is? I am the Lord. This is who I am. I'm a faithful God. God sings this song. He, he puts the chorus at the beginning, the middle, and the end. What's the problem here? All these things are going wrong, they, not the way you expected. Well, here, let me, let me just kind of stop this, and we're going to take a hard right. I am the Lord. Let me sing you a song. I'm going to sing you a song of redemption. I'm going to sing you a song of who I am. Right? We see in this song, God is saying, okay, there's all these problems going on. It's not what you expected. Here's one more thing you did not expect. In response to that, I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to sing to you about who I am. I am a God who is faithful, right? That's all through the song, right? What's going on in the song? <laughs> I made these promises. I made these promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I made a covenant, and I promised. And they're going to happen, and I'm going to fulfill them. I'm going to be faithful in my promise. Why? The chorus. Because I am the Lord. That's who God is. That's what he does when he responds to them. It's not, um, get your act together. Didn't I tell you I'm going to do this? Um, suck it up. No, he shows them who he is. He feeds them with God himself. He shows them who God is. Right? This is, this is something that God is going to accomplish in their story and in your story. God will not share his glory. God will accomplish this on his own terms so that he gets the credit. Not Pharaoh. Right? It would be a great story for Pharaoh to get the credit for this. People of Israel... They had all these problems, and then I had this political mastermind idea. We're just going to send them out to be their own people and lose our entire workforce. I mean, that sounds like a good PR. Pharaoh doesn't get to share this with God. God, in your story, in your life, he will be the one that writes it because he will satisfy you with nothing else but himself. But you'll notice one other thing about this song, right? Um, it's a bit wordy. There's a lot of words in this song. There's six verses, a little chorus. This is a comment. This is why we sing songs that have a lot of words in them. <laughs> There's a lot to say about who God is, to celebrate his goodness, to say, God, you're great, you're faithful and good. Right? We can just say that. God, you're great, 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 faithful and good. But there's a lot of words to how to describe that. God, you've been faithful to us in our suffering. You've been faithful to us in our affliction. God, you've been faithful to me when you blessed us with those things that we prayed for 10 years for. God, you've been faithful. You are good. So there, there, this is a rather big book about um, how God has been faithful and good and fulfilled his promises, which is why our songs tend to have a lot of words in them. <laughs> there's a lot to say about who God is and how great he is and how wonderful he is and how kind he is. So just as a comment, if you ever think, man, there's just a, our songs are a little wordy. <laughs> it's because we're just following God's pattern. We love to sing songs. And that's not to say all of our songs are going to be wordy. We have some songs that are more simple. So it's not a universal. But this is, this is what we're, we're saying, right? God's made promises. 
and God's going to fulfill them because of who God is. And we're going to sing about it, right? So we're going to sing songs that are about lots of different parts of scripture, lots of different promises. And when we do that, so we're going to close with songs. When we do that, here's what we're doing. We're saying, God, you've said, this is who you are. God, this is the promise that you've made. And now we're bringing it to, we're bringing it back to you. God, we want to celebrate that. And then we want to live in that, God. So would you fulfill these promises that you've made to us, right? If God's made a promise, we should be able to take that promise back to God and say, then how? Make this real to me in my life. We can do that in singing. I mean, praying, praying those things too, but that's what we sing them to God because we want to, as the chorus of this verse is, this song is, to celebrate who God is. So, after God's led them in singing, let's just close up by looking at this last section. Chapter, uh, chapter 6, we're going to pick up in verse 9. Verse 9 to chapter 7, verse 7. Again, we're not going to read all of this, but we're going to look at God's unexpected grace. Now, this is probably a part of the Bible where a lot of us begin to, th- kind of our eyes begin to roll back into our head and think, all these genealogies, what is up with the phone book and the Bible, right? Like, why, is that, why do they just put this phone book here? All these names, I don't know who they are. I don't even know how to pronounce them. I don't even know why they're all here. So, but that is, what we're going to do is we're just gonna, I'm just going to pull out one little section of this because there's something here for us to see that we could get lost in the details. So we're just going to look at verse uh, 19 and 20, and then 26 and 27. These are the clans of the Levites according to the generations. Amram took for his wife Jechabed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. The years of the life of Amram were about 137 years. And these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their host. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh king of Egypt about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt. This Moses and this Aaron. So, In the storyline, one of the things that this genealogy does, in the storyline, there's been all these setbacks. You know, they start out and they're tripping over themselves already, right? Not going the way they expected. So the start out is just to say, look, these people are legit God people, right? God chose them. They're legit. They're from the Levites, which is kind of like, uh, they're like the pastors of the people back then. And so they just said, look, these are God's people. This is who God's chosen. But there's a part of the story, this genealogy that we could miss because, um, Levi, so in the storyline of the Bible, right, I, I don't expect you to know this. Storyline of the Bible, like 430 years before, it had been the, the 12 sons of Jacob, right? And Levi was one of them. Now, if you're doing your math, you have Levi in this genealogy. You have Levi, Korath, so his son, and then Amram, so Levi's grandson, and then Moses and Aaron. Now, I'm not an expert, but that is a long time. <laughs> Which is to say, they weren't, they weren't like the immediate descendants of them, right? So there's not like, there's a lot of people that were not mentioned in that genealogy. But the genealogy is specifically mentioned here in this way to say, you have Levi and then really close, you have Moses and Aaron. And the point is effectively in the genealogy to present it as though Moses and Aaron have been adopted into like the clans. Like they're up at the top, right? That what's happening in this genealogy is they're saying like, okay, Moses and Aaron, they're born later, but in terms of their value to God and their value to the story, they are adopted right up here to the top. They're like really super important, right? You got Levi, priestly dude, and then you got these guys right up behind, right? They've been adopted up, and which is to say, um, when God's grace works in people's lives, uh, we don't get what we would expect. We... We see in this story, Moses and Aaron already, Moses more so than Aaron, they're not who you would expect, right? Moses, remember, is a murderer, right? Moses has murdered somebody, and then he fled, and um, not necessarily the greatest resume. He didn't want to take the job, and he tried to get out of it multiple times, right? Not the most common commending leader. But God looks at him and says, I am going to effectively adopt you into the high clan, right? The inner circle. These are the dudes. Their names are going to go down forever. 
I'm going to use you like I'll use them. You are being adopted up into this high place. And when grace comes into our lives, we are in the same way adopted into God's family. Remember how we talked about earlier? We were adopted in Christ to be a part of God's family. Grace makes us a part of the family of God. God comes in and graciously treats Moses the way he shouldn't be treated because that's the way God is. God brings Moses up into this part of the storyline to highlight that God brings us into his family, highlight that God's grace doesn't treat us the way we would expect, right? Moses should not be in this story the way he is. And yet God has adopted him by his grace and treated him the way he shouldn't be because of who God is. When we trust in Christ, when we look to Christ, we are adopted into God's family. Grace grace always goes overboard, right? Grace always does, does not operate the way we would expect it to. Grace, God's kindness to us, his grace always goes overboard because he doesn't just kind of treat us as like, oh, thanks for coming to King's Cross tonight, guys. I'm glad that you were human people in this room together um, opening my book and talking about me. God does not look at us and say that. God looks at us in Christ and says, no, you are, you are my family, right? You are the family of God. In Christ, he has adopted us in Jesus. We, when we gather together around the dinner table tonight, it's not just because uh, we're hungry and it's five o'clock on a Saturday night and if you're going to come out here, we're going to have dinner. But it's because as a family in Jesus, we come together adopted by God's grace into his family. I, just, I, I had to go here. Let's just go to Galatians. We're going to close with this. Galatians chapter 4. I'm sure you might be thinking about this. Galatians 4. Sorry, chapter th- verse 3. In the same way, so this is talking about um, chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Remember the son of Israel, the son who is the perfect Israel. He sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because we are sons and daughters of the living God, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave. Right? These people in the story of Exodus, they are slaves, and God is leading them out to freedom as his son. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. That means that you have been led out of Satan's sin and death. You've been led out from under the darkness of your, of your bondage to your sin. And by Jesus, you are led to receive the infinite flowing fountain of God himself. You, are, you inherit God. You get God. You get God himself, which is not what we would expect. We would expect to kind of be delivered into, all right, which is kind of be in this kind of copacetic life, and we're going to be okay, and God's going to be nice, but he's going to be the big guy upstairs. We're going to kind of do our own thing, and we're going to pay our taxes, and everything's going to be okay. When God saves us, he delivers us. He delivers us into this intimate, personal relationship with him because we are now not slaves but sons and daughters of the living God. We get God himself, which is not what we would expect. And so I think one of the things that we should learn from this section of Exodus is that we cannot trust our expectations. We cannot trust our expectations of who God is, of how he works, of how he delivers us and protects us. We cannot, our expectations might lead us to think, God's really angry with me, and he's always frowning at me. And now I just kind of need to do my religious duty and get by. But God delivers us to himself, makes us a part of his family, leads us in worship, and graciously makes us a part of, who, of his family in Jesus, right? This is God's story. We, we cannot trust our expectations. So maybe one of the things to think about this week or tonight is to say, what are the expectations of what I think God should be doing? What are the expectations that maybe I'm seeing that I need to not trust in? 
What are the expectations that maybe I need to be repenting of? God, I expected you to do this. Holding God up to your own standard. Maybe we need to be repenting of that. But then, the point of the passage is to lead us to trust in God. Trust in, trusting in who God is rather than our expectations. God exceeds and surprises us. And we can trust him. We can trust this unexpected God. So let's pray. Father, as we have heard from your word and looked at these ways that you have surprised us, you don't don't operate according to our expectations. But God, we love you because you have made us a part of your family. And so God, as we think about the ways that we have held up expectations of who you are and the way you should work, God, we ask you would help us to repent of those things and to trust in you and to joyfully follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from King's Cross Church in Manchester, New Hampshire. Please feel free to share or distribute this content, but do not charge for it or alter the content in any way without permission. King's Cross Church exists to treasure, proclaim, and grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out more about King's Cross Church, please visit us at kingscrossmanchester.com.